had a feeling that things were really beginning to heat up, especially in light that you had a looming U.S. decision on whether or not to arm the YPG directly. Uh, and, of course, you had an upcoming visit to Washington by President Erdogan in mid-May. Well, of course, things never quite work out the way you want them to. Uh, we weren't able to get that panel scheduled uh, immediately. And, in fact, when we looked at the calendar and uh, gathered with our, our, uh, our panelists, we found that the first time that we could do it would be now in the first week of, uh, of June and, and today, in fact, which was more than five weeks after ICON and I had first discussed the issue. Uh, and, of course, five weeks in Washington, not to mention in world uh, affairs, can, can you know, be a lifetime. So you sort of wonder to yourself, um, will the event still make sense at that point? Will anyone still be interested? And will the topic somehow be overtaken by events? But I think uh, we've got the, the answer here today in this, this audience. We've got a really a packed house, uh, which is helped, no doubt, by the fact that even though a lot has happened in this intervening period, uh, it was just within the past few days, of course, that the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, led by uh, the forces of the YPG, uh, launched what we hope is the final uh, military operation to actually evict ISIS from uh, Raqqa. And even just this morning, we've gotten some uh, new news, which is that in Iraq, the Kurdistan regional government has, in fact, set now a specific date at the end of September to hold its own referendum on independence and its relationship and status to Baghdad and to the Iraqi state. Um, as I said, a lot has happened in the past month. Uh, most importantly, the uh, long-delayed U.S. decision to directly arm the YPG over the vociferous objections of a long-standing uh, U.S. NATO ally in Turkey. Uh, we now know, uh, or can be quite sure, that the most critical phase of this long, drawn-out, three-year war to destroy ISIS's caliphate in Iraq, which is, um, after all, uh, probably President Trump's highest foreign policy priority, that that objective is going to be achieved by an unlikely Kurdish-Arab alliance that is dominated by a close affiliate of a U.S. designated terrorist organization, the PKK, and it will be heavily backed by U.S. air power and special forces on the ground. My opinion, but I think that's a big deal, um, something that you don't see every day. For better or worse, it's an inflection point of sorts that will almost certainly have all kinds of follow-on uh, ramifications, both big and small, not only for the future of Syria, but for the future of the region and for the tra trajectory of U.S. foreign policy. And it's a subject that, at least among experts, has generated a fair amount of debate, particularly regarding the wisdom of the decision to partner so closely with the YPG and what that may pretend for the future, especially for U.S. interests. Uh, the purpose of today's discussion is to try and bring out some of that debate and to explore some of those ramifications. And to help us do that, I'm glad that, as always, we've assembled a very stellar panel. Uh, to my immediate right is David Pollack, the Kaufman Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he directs Project FICRA, which is a very, very interesting um, networking and publishing platform, largely for Middle Easterners themselves, that seeks to combat extremism through the promotion of positive policy ideas and recommendations. David also had a long career as an analyst of Middle East affairs in the U.S. government and among many of his other great actors.
Ambrin's defense minister, Liam Fox. Uh, Ambrin Zaman is uh, hopefully well known to this audience. Uh, Ambrin is a veteran journalist and one of Washington's most respected observers of Turkey, and especially all things having to do with uh, the Kurds. Amberin is currently a columnist for the independent online Turkish news portal Diken, as well as the widely read website of Middle East Affairs El Monitor. Uh, Amberin is currently a public policy fellow, no, was a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center until recently, and is also, we're very happy to say, uh, serves on the board of advisors of FDD's Turkey program. And then finally, last but not least, is my colleague Ikan Erdemir, a senior fellow here at FDD and a former opposition member of Turkey's parliament. So welcome to all the panelists and thanks very much for being here. Let me kick off the conversation by uh, getting at least some of you to talk briefly about your views on the key issue that really has brought us to this point, which is, of course, the decision the president made last month to go forward in arming the YPG. It was something that a lot of people had been expecting was going to happen for months, but with the U.S. elections and the transition to a new administration, it got repeatedly postponed and was the subject of a lot of controversy, both here in Washington and between Washington and, and, and Turkey in particular. So David, let me go to you first and see if you can get us started just by quickly laying out some of the factors that have shaped your assessment of whether this U.S. strategy to partner with the YPG in this way makes sense to you. Sure. Uh, thanks very much, John, and thanks to all of you for being here and to <coughs> FDD for hosting this great panel and to all my co-panelists as well. Uh, my short answer to your question is yes, definitely. I think it makes very good sense. and. I think that the main rationale for uh, the relationship between the U.S. government and particularly the U.S. military and the PYD, YPG, and its allied Arab and other militias in Syria is a security rationale. It's not uh, an expression or an attempt to uh, drive a wedge as far as the U.S. government sees it between the United States and a very important NATO ally in Turkey. It is simply a way of what we believe, what I believe, of fighting effectively against ISIS in Syria while um, also directing Kurdish aspirations in Syria, not against Turkey, but against ISIS and on behalf of Kurdish autonomy inside Syria. This is not intended to be, and in my view, it is, in fact, not an anti-Turkish move of any kind. It is not a threat to Turkey's national security, although I know very well that the Turkish government disagrees with me on this, but I believe that ultimately they can be convinced of that. And for that reason, I think that this is one instance in which the United States can have it both ways, can be a close military and political partner with the Syrian Kurds and with Turkey. And the evidence for that is that despite the vociferous Turkish government objections to this policy ever since it started, and it started long before, as you said in your introduction, the most recent decision to arm the YPG directly, Despite those very vociferous Turkish government objections, Turkey and the United States have continued to cooperate on almost all of the issues that are important to both of us. And so Erdogan, for example, did not cancel or postpone his visit to Washington after we made this latest announcement about arming the YPG. There was no major um, controversy over this during his visit or since. Indrilik Air Base is still at the disposal of the United States and the coalition in the fight against ISIS, which is a shared interest that the U.S., the Kurds, and Turkey, and all of our other partners have in common. And so I don't see this as having to choose sides between the YPG and Turkey. I think we can 
<laughs> be friends with both. Right. Good. Luke, I'm, let me let you pick up on that. Yes. Um, well, first, I want to echo all the thanks and appreciation for uh, FDD hosting this event and very kindly asking me to, to speak and give my thoughts. I, I fully appreciate that there are some really good arguments to both sides of this debate. Um, but it's probably n um, not a coincidence that they put me after uh, <laughs> because uh, I have to respectfully uh, disagree with my, with my colleague here. Um, look, after almost seven years, six years or so of civil war in Syria, the reality is the moderates are either dead or they've left. And frankly speaking, there are very few groups, if any, in Syria I would give so much as a BB gun to, much less armed with advanced weaponry. Because we have no idea where this is going, how it's going to be used after, after the initial act. And in, in case, uh, so that's sort of like how I approach this issue to begin with. I'm skeptical from the beginning on arming these sort of groups. With the YPG in particular, I think that most Americans would probably be shocked if they cared to really learn much about the situation to discover that we are um, arming a group with its ideology based in Marxism and with its links and connections to that of a group that's designated as a terrorist organization by the U.S. State Department in order to fight another terrorist group. Um, like I said, I appreciate that there are good arguments to this uh, for both sides, but I just think um, if, if the cost of getting Raqqa to fall quickly is arming a group like the YPG, then I don't think Raqqa falling quickly is frankly worth the cost. And Frankly, I don't think ISIS needs Raqqa or territory in Syria to launch attacks. And actually, if the past 10 weeks have shown us anything, it's that they're, they seem to be more active as they have less territory. So I am completely sympathetic to, and I don't like to say the Turkish government, to the Turkish people on this matter. Um, Turkey is a NATO ally and a NATO partner and the U.S. is essentially arming a group that's responsible for killing NATO soldiers. Um, this isn't an anti-Kurd issue. Uh, if you look at the title of the program uh, today, If I was a Georgian soldier or a Ukrainian soldier who has, especially Georgia, sacrificed so much for the U.S. in places like Afghanistan, and we will not give them the same weapons we are now giving to YPG or so-called moderate groups in Syria, I would think it's outrageous that I can go on YouTube and find videos of these groups using these weapons that the U.S. government will not provide some of our closest uh, allies in, in Europe. So, um, like I said, I appreciate there are great arguments uh, on both sides of this debate. Um, and I'm sure many of you disagree with what I have to say, but this is uh, my view on, uh, on uh, the specific question uh -huh. about arming the YPG. Are you, are you offering a Georgian battalion to come uh, liberate Raqqa? Or, uh, <laughs> I bet, we could, I bet <laughs> we could work out the weapons issues now. Yeah. Um, what, did you actually, before this decision, have your own uh, plan to liberate Raqqa quickly? Or had, did you put well, forward something? Well, here's the thing. Just because there's a civil war in Syria doesn't mean that the U.S. has to pick a side. Uh, the world is not black and white. It's not <coughs> military intervention or, or isolationism. It's not engagement or withdrawal. There are things right. in the middle that we can and should do. 
Um, right, so but the, pre the president would have come to you, President Trump, presumably, and said, listen, I've spent months on the campaign trail saying I'm going to defeat this organization very quickly. That must mean taking down the caliphate in Mosul yeah. and Raqqa. So how do I do that? If he came to Luke Coffey and said, yeah. well, what do I do, Luke, if I'm not going to go the route with the, the guys we've been fighting with, as what he, do I do? As he would be approaching me with this question, I would immediately be thinking in my mind whether well, many things you said on the campaign trail that you've now changed your mind on. So, um, but. I would, I would su suggest to him that you talk about America first, Mr. President, and keeping Americans safe. And the number one way you're going to keep us safe in the United States from ISIS attacks is better homeland security, better counterterrorism, better law enforcement integration, better security structures in the United States within the framework of our Constitution. That's the best way to keep us safe. Because okay. we can liberate Raqqa tomorrow, and someone can blow themselves up in Union Station, and it, it's not going to matter if Raqqa is held by ISIS or not. The second thing I would propose that the, the president should do is ensure regional stability around the civil war, around the conflict. So this means restoring Iraq's territorial integrity. This means ensuring that the huge numbers of refugees that are in the neighboring countries around Syria do not become a destabilizing force within that country so the civil war inside Syria doesn't spread across borders and help alleviate the, um, alleviate the refugee burden uh, by providing more assistance around the, this region. And then finally, in improving the security sector uh, reforms that are m desperately needed in many of these countries around Syria, again, as a measure to make sure the war doesn't spill over. Okay. But this idea that we're going to solve Syria's civil war or that as soon as Raqqa falls, it's all going to be the land of milk and honey, I mean, we have a very long road ahead of us, a very long road, and we've just now started heading in, in the direction. Okay. Amber and, and Ike and I want you to, I don't need you to say what the U.S. should or shouldn't do necessarily, but just on, based on what you've heard from your perspectives and the actors that you follow in the region, can you just give your, your comments and reflections on, on well, this debate? Thank you for hosting us. Um, I, I both agree with bits of what you said and disagree with other bits of what you both said. Um, I think, first of all, you spoke of a strategy. I don't think it was a strategy. I think it was pure accident that the U United States and the YPG ended up together. And I, I think uh, Turkey was one of the big drivers of that. It's a uh, lack of action in the face of ISIS. Turkey was given two years to do something, uh, to bring together an alternative to the YPG. The United States you know, indulged Turkey for a full two years, and it failed. It failed to come up with an alternative. Uh, so we first of all need to remember that. But setting aside, you know, uh, whether it was right or wrong, uh, we, have, we need to remember why the PKK actually exists. And the PKK, the PKK exists because Turkey has a huge Kurdish problem that it's failed to fix. That is why the, the PKK exists, and that's why this problem is uh, continuing. Uh, the fact that Turkey has decided to revert to a military, so-called military solution, and that's really not, you can't blame the United States for that. Uh, and the United States had an urgent need, I believe, I disagree with you, to, to do something <coughs> about Raqqa, to, do, to defeat ISIS in Syria. I think it's of tremendous uh, symbolic value, if nothing else, to, to be able to do that. And the YPG is, yes, the most effective force on the ground who can help them do that. Um, I also believe that, in fact, the United States has, whether deliberately or not, achieved a very um, sort of good, if cynical, equilibrium in Syria where on the one hand, um, it, you know, the YPG is forced to do Raqqa without wresting any major concessions from the United States, purely, purely because the United States is pretty much its sole protector against Turkey. And um, conversely, uh, the United States is now in a position to rein in the YPG against Turkey, if need be. Uh, so it's an interesting situation. It's an incredibly gray situation, because for now, we have no idea whether the United States <coughs> has an end game for Syria or if it ever will have one. <coughs> but in the meantime, I think certainly from the YPG's point of view, uh, it feels that uh, it's a relationship worth pursuing, that it wants to have as many options on the table as it can, and that's why it's doing this. 
and until such time, you know, the United States acts in ways that are directly at odds with the YPG's own interests, I think this I'd like to present an optimistic view, which, which is quite rare coming from me. Uh, I think we underestimate Turkey's capacity for flexibility. Uh, I do agree it's a great situation. There are wonderful pros and cons that our speakers have provided. And if there is one country on earth that could get this gray issue vis-a-vis -vis US YPG relationship, it's Turkey. Because there is no other country than the US that has worked with YPG and PYD, except for Turkey. Now we forget about this, but between 2013 and 2015, uh, PYD leader Salih Müslüm was hosted three times in Turkey, twice in Istanbul, once in Ankara. Turkey coordinated the February 2015 Süleyman Shah shrine operation with YPG, and there was a five kilometer security corridor provided by YPG fighters to Turkey, and there was even a crisis center co, let's say, managed by Turkish and Syrian Kurdish, that is PYD officials. And not only PYD, but there was the spokesperson of the YPG in Ankara during that operation, in the run-up to that operation, which shows Turkey can be as tactical as the US when it comes to PYD and YPG. Now, that is one of my reasons for optimism, because today's Turkey, despite the state of emergency, despite this horrible descent into authoritarianism, despite the imprisonment of you know, mayors and lawmakers and co-chairs <laughs> of HDP, is a different country. Because Amdirin and I come from a Turkey where the word Kurd did not exist. Officially, Kurd was defined as mountain Turk. Now it's no longer the case. Now, Turkey has a very cordial relationship with the KRG. And back then, we only had insult, words of insult to talk about uh, Iraqi Kurds. Uh, in Turkey, we now have an official channel that broadcasts in Kurdish. Unthinkable. So what I'm trying to say is this. Uh, although this is a, a major challenge to Turkish government domestically, that is, they do have to keep up posturing. They do have to keep up a, a strong anti-American rhetoric at home. When it comes to global politics, I think they are willing to live with this decision. Uh, I, I think they also see this as tactical, because they themselves know what it means to work with PYD and YPG in a tactical manner. They have done it for two and a half years. So at this point, I think Turkey has its eye on the day after. For Turkey, it matters less what's done today. Probably Turkish government is happy that it's the YPG that's really bleeding in trying to liberate Raqqa. But if the day after the liberation of Raqqa uh, and, and Syria, uh, if there is a new game that Turkey is a part of, then I think uh, Erdogan and his uh, inner circle will be happy about it. And let me end, end on this note. One of his senior advisors in Nurcevic, in speaking to a New York Times reporter, he said, 
we can tolerate a Kurdish entity in you know, northeast Syria, he said, as long as it's to the east of Euphrates. But more importantly, he hinted something very important. He said, why shouldn't they, meaning you know, PYD, YPG, become another Barzai, he said. And there, I think, is the, the, the clue to Turkish flexibility. You know, he's hinting that Turkey used to have very bad relations with Iraqi Kurds, but managed to find a modus vivendi, which then turned into a win-win situation, helping both countries economically, politically, from security point of view. And I think he's hinting that there might be a day when Syrian Kurds, not necessarily the Kurds that Turkey prefers, but even these Kurds that Turkey doesn't like, might find a modus vivendi <laughs> with Turkey that's similar to the KRG. Can I just? Uh, does everybody else share that no. optimism? I mean, it, uh, uh, well, I mean, I mean, I, I guess my first question: Do you share the optimism that you expressed your, uh, yourself that they've got to suck, suck this well, up? But well, in well, the context but, of Amber, the let me let me just finish. Yeah. Let me just finish, because it it was striking. I mean, in the whole lead up to this decision, uh, it was such a big issue uh, that Erdogan and the AKP made out of this decision. There was huge amounts of huffing and puffing, even threats. There was military attack across the border that allegedly could have put U.S. troops in some degree of jeopardy. Then the guy shows up to Washington, and other than a very unpleasant incident in Sheridan Circle, um, it's kind of a nothing burger. The entire event, there's no <coughs> showdown with Trump over the decision to arm the, the, the YPG. So I'm, I'm wondering, let me just ask both Luke and David first, do you actually agree that it looks like there's not much at this point in time, maybe the day after rocket fall, but right now there's not much that Turkey can do, even though it views this, this issue so critically as a domestic matter at a minimum, um, that basically it's kind of free sailing now, at least during this military operation in, in Raqqa as far as the Turks are concerned. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's right. But I, I, and I do think that in the long run, there's at least a possibility, as Icon put it. I would not say that I'm maybe as optimistic as you sounded, but there's at least a possibility in principle that someday Turkish relations with the Syrian Kurds could be somewhat analogous to, that is basically friendly and cooperative and mutually beneficial with Turkey's relations to the Iraqi Kurds, to Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I think that's a real possibility. But I, I want to just say one yeah. or two other yeah. really quick things yeah. that I think are important to get out on the table. W the reason, in my view, that Turkey can accept this is not because they can't do anything about it. They could if they really wanted to. They went in to Syria in a major military operation a little under a year ago, in August of last year, and split the Kurdish enclave in, or the potential Kurdish enclave in Syria into two. Turkey did take over a very significant chunk of Syrian territory in order to separate the Kurdish cantons in that country. They could do something like that, but they know deep down, I believe, that they don't need to, that actually the PYD and the YPG are not a threat to Turkey. They are not the same as the PKK. They have not supported the PKK for the last five years. And the evidence for that is that when I have been privileged to hear intelligence briefings by senior Turkish officials themselves presenting their evidence of drug smuggling and weapons smuggling and terrorists crossing the border from Syria into Turkey, the only places on the border in their own presentations in which that is not happening are the areas controlled by the PYD and the YPG. The fact is that although these two Kurdish movements share a history, an ideology, a symbolic leader in Abdullah Öcalan, for the last five years, ever since Barzani brought together in Erbil, the PYD and, 
and other Kurdish factions and hammered out an agreement. The YPG and the PYD as institutions, I'm not talking about individuals who may have crossed from one group to the other. As institutions, they have focused on their aspirations inside Syria, not against Turkey. They have not attacked Turkish forces inside Syria. They have not attacked Turkey across the border from Syria. They have not supported the PKK in its fight against Turkey, whether justified or not. That's not my issue here. They have not, in fact, supported the PKK against Turkey. And I believe that deep down, despite all the rhetoric, the Turkish government understands that. If you were Turkey, would you rather have, as Icon, I think, or somebody implied, would you rather have the YPG going south toward Raqqa or north toward the Turkish borders and in support of the PKK? The answer is obvious. Luke, do you, do you see the, the, the stakes as actually much higher than this? In terms, do, you, are, do you worry about a, a, a major rupture in the U.S.-Turkish relationship that we could be headed in that direction, or are you, are you sanguine about no, it? I mean, this isn't really the aspect of it that concerns me. I mean, uh, Erdogan's a very flexible, pragmatic man. He's shown this. I mean, it's about regime survival. It's about maintaining his power. And, um, you know, he, I don't think he could really do much about it. Of course he was going to come to Washington. He's not going to cancel... Uh, a visit to meet the new president of the United States over an issue like this, especially when on all other issues, um, uh, putting aside the arming the YPG issue, I think President Trump is very sympathetic um, to uh, other Tur uh, issues pertaining to current U.S.-Turkish re relations. So this aspect of it doesn't really bother me. What bothers me about this is this idea that we fight terrorism with terrorism. I mean, this is the same argument that Russia now uses, or Russian officials use, when they say that they're supporting the Taliban now in Afghanistan against ISIS. Um, you don't have to, um, we as the United States do not have to get involved in a civil war, and there are other ways to protect Americans from the threat of ISIS terrorism than arming a group like the YPG and marching them to Raqqa. Now, there's been a lot of talk about tactics. This is a tactical move. Turkey is agreeing this because of tactics. The U.S. is agreeing to do this because of the tactical situation. Actually, I agree with that. I mean, like I said, you take the you have the best group of fighters, which are the YPG, the bravest, which are the YPG, and you march them to your objective. Well, that's all fine, but maybe for once in American foreign policy, we'll start thinking about the second and third order effects of what we are doing, especially in the Middle East. And I just do not see an outcome that the U.S. can engineer in Syria that meets what we really need to achieve in, in the region. So I, I, I am very skeptical um, on, on, on this, but I really think I need to yield the rest of my time yeah, to the Amber is about to, uh, she is ready no, she's to, a, <laughs> to launch. I, I just go. <laughs> serves absolutely no useful purpose to go on and on about how the YPG and the PKK are different. The PYD was established under the aegis of the PKK in 2003. Abdullah Öcalan lived in Syria for 19 years where he organized his movement on the sole condition that he directed against Turkey. But you'd be naive to think that somehow this, isn't, this didn't mobilize Kurdish nationalism inside Syria among Syrian Kurds. Uh, and, you know, they don't see those borders and they're becoming increasingly irrelevant in the Kurdish mind. I don't, I mean, do you really believe that the YPG would continue to be your ally if you went and killed Jemil Bayuk, wiped out the entire PKK leadership? They'd be like, oh, we're different, doesn't matter. Do you really think your relationship would be sustainable with them? Yes. I don't. And I think it's a pure fantasy to imagine that you can somehow spin off the YPG, PYD away from the PKK, it won't go anywhere. <laughs> and the oh, wait, root wait, wait, cause wait, wait. of this problem is inside Turkey, Turkey's failure to address its Kurdish problem, right. which has uh, now spilled well beyond its borders. Okay. It wait. had an opportunity to fix it. It squandered that opportunity most spectacularly in June 2015 when, uh, s when the HTP Correct. Uh, won all those yeah. seats in the parliament when the public was ready to move forward on this draft roadmap that yes. was unveiled in 
February of 2015 as well, and then Erdogan threw all of that in the rubbish bin. Right. Let me, because you were, I, I thought you were disagreeing with, with Icon's point as well about recreating what happened in the KRG, to, that Turkey well, could in any all, way you switch it. can't recreate what happened. First of all, the, the, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the uh, KDP or the P, uh, nor the PUK ever fought Turkey. They did not you know, kill Turkish soldiers in large numbers, to the best of my knowledge. I don't think you can draw those kinds of comparisons so easily. Okay, stop, Doug, avoid the comparison. Can they have a relation? Can they? Sure, they can have you, a relationship. Do you have optimism they can the build a constructive of a relationship? border peace deal with its own Kurds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, can I give a yes or no answer to this? Yes, meaning, go. There's a pro and con, meaning. I think this can happen, meaning uh, Turkish flexibility, re repeating what Turkey did with KRG. And what makes it possible is Erdogan's complete unaccountability. <laughs> because it often takes uh, kind of uh, an, an autocrat to push this in Turkey. And he, is, he has shown repeatedly that he's capable of doing anything, selling anything to his electorate. He can do U-turns every other day, and people will cheer. So that's why I believe it's possible with Erdogan. But then there is kind of a, a, a downside to this. There, 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 there is an obstacle. And the obstacle is Erdogan seems to have a new alliance with neo-nationalists in Turkey. He has brought in many of the state operatives who were responsible for the atrocities against the Kurds in the 1990s. Now, that security apparatus, what is often associated with Turkey's deep state, would they allow Erdogan to be pragmatic and flexible on this issue? And I would really love to have Amberi's answer if, if you like allow. To say yeah. and I would love to hear what Pishyar has to say. No, 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 very quickly. We'll go to Q&A Q &A very Q &A. quickly. Yeah. I've got some other things I need but, to move on I to, think, but go ahead, you know, very quickly. <laughs> Look at where the Iraqi Kurds are today. They, they have things that the Turkish Kurds could never even dream of, yet it's not enough. They want independence because it all came too late. And I rather fear that the way things are headed in Turkey, that's where we may end up as well. Because the, the Turkish Kurds are at least, you know, a significant portion of Turkish Kurds feel increasingly alienated, do not see a common future with Turkey. And, you know, if they don't do something fast, it's going to, you know, by the time they do get to the point I, I can describe, it may be too late. Let's uh, uh, move to uh, talking about the future a little bit. Um, Rock is liberated. Uh, a bunch of actors have got to make decisions. YPG has to make a decision about what it's going to do. We need to figure out who's going to actually hold and govern in, in Raqqa. Uh, I imagine uh, the Assad regime, the Americans, the Iranians, maybe even the Russians have got to decide how they then respond to that new situation in uh, northeastern Syria. Um, uh, Amber, and let me just quickly on the YPG, do you know uh, what their plans are with regard to Raqqa? Are they going to withdraw once the military part of this is done, do They've you think? They've already set up their council. Um, there are 150 members of which only 15 are apparently Kurds, but the co-chair is a Kurd. And they have, uh, I think, they're in a very strong position, really, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arabs. Th though some of the Arabs, like Jarba, are trying to leverage their sort of relationship with the YPG to sort of, anyway, advance their own interests going further south. Uh, but, I mean, do they plan? I don't think so. No, why would they? I mean, they're laying down their lives. They want to have a say because they see it as part of a broader um, plan to for, for federalism in Syria at the very least. So they want to position themselves so that they can continue to, you know, leverage their military contribution into political, a political status in a future Syria. But you think so they won't just relinquish, you but know. But will their strategy to be to hand it over to their Arab allies in the Syrian Democratic well, Forces to actually by hand over, at I mean. the people policing in the streets and maintaining security in the city of Raqqa on top of a lot of Sunni Arabs are going to be Sunni Arabs? Well, I think that YPG is kind of going to be the glue there because these Sunni Arabs don't necessarily always get on very well. And so I think the 
Kurds will sort of in insert themselves into more of a, a sort of um, um, Hakem Yakimsidin, yeah? Yeah, kind of, referee. Oh, what, a referee, uh-huh. David, do you have a, a view on this, on what their strategy might be, why they got involved in Raqqa, and are they likely to try and stay there? Or once the job is done, they'll, they'll retreat and try and generate international support for uh, Rojava? Um, I don't think anybody really knows, uh, and I don't think they know exactly. And I think it does depend on uh, so many other players who are going to be uh, making claims or advances, I mean physically actually advancing toward Raqqa and its vicinity. But in general, I think the most likely scenario is, uh, on this point I do agree with Amber, in that, that the YPG will uh, probably want to do in Raqqa more or less what they've done in Manbij. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is to um, continue to exert uh, kind of indirect uh, control through whatever political structures are set up, but most of all because of continuing military presence or militia presence in and around the city. Although Raqqa is much bigger than Manbij, uh, the demographics are not as favorable and um, outside players are going to be, I think, more intent on, um, in particular, the Assad regime and its allies on staking claims once uh, ISIS is kicked out. So I, I would just say that from the point of view of the U.S. government and the U.S. military, and I don't represent them, but I have spoken to them in great detail and at senior levels about this, they view Manbij, believe it or not, as a success story and as a model for Raqqa. That is mm -hmm. a situation in which a hotly contested, very strategically located, piece of territory with a very mixed population on which all of the outside players, including Iran, Russia, the Kurds, the Arabs, the Turks, the Assad regime, <laughs> and everybody else has some claims or at least some intentions. Nevertheless, that's a place that is relatively stable and where active fighting is not going on. Now, whether that's sustainable for the long term in Raqqa, that's an open question. But at least for starters, that's how I see it. And I do want to say I must take great issue with Luke's characterization of the U.S. alliance with the YPG and the PYD as using terrorists to fight other terrorists. The YPG and the PYD, in my estimation and in the official U.S. government uh, definition, are not terrorists. The PKK are. Okay. Um, just on, on Turkey, if, if in fact this scenario is right, that in fact um, the YPG is going to Raqqa and it's likely to stay in Raqqa and be a significant force of influence there, um, I can see that creating obviously its own issues in, in, in an ethnic and, uh, uh, sense. But uh, what would, does Turkey have a view of, of that, do you think, if that was the scenario that was to play out? I think the day after, it's, it's a whole new game for Turkey. Uh, that is, Turkey could try to exert influence through its Kurdish and Arab proxies. Uh, th there the challenge would be, uh, as we have seen with the current PYD-controlled enclaves, uh, there, there is not an openness to power sharing. There is not an openness <coughs> uh, for to allow Turkish proxies, whether Kurdish or Arab or others, to operate. So. The same question would be valid for Raqqa and its environs. That is, when Turkey tries to enter this game uh, through its proxies, uh, will the, let's say, PYD-dominated council and YPG-dominated security apparatus, will they allow, uh, that is, w would Raqqa evolve to a power sharing where conflict is expressed through politics but not through violence. That, that's a big question. And overall, I think the best strategy for Turkey, I agree with Amberin, the best foreign policy strategy for Turkey would have been a domestic one, that is tackling the Kurdish question at home. Because as soon as Turkey is back on track on the peace process, as soon as Turkey is able to find a way to incorporate uh, its Kurdish citizens, the whole Middle East 
scenario, the whole matrix changes I in a very favorable way for Turkey. And th th that was the reason why between 2013 and 2015, Turkey could work with PYD and in at least one instance with YPG. Why? Because there was peace process back at home. So if Turkey wants to have a stronger hand in foreign policy in the Middle East, I think the best move, best first step forward would be peace process back at home. Good. Luke, I want to just uh, uh, draw back and think about if there are any geopolitical implications to what happens after the YPG-dominated alliance liberates Raqqa. Maybe they stay in Raqqa. Um, obviously, they are then uh, the main force that actually defeated the, the caliphate inside of Syria. A lot of, uh, at least temporarily, international applauds, I, I imagine, that they, they've done that and achieved that. Um, we do know that certainly with the PKK, long-standing Russian and Iranian links uh, to the PKK. I imagine there are such links with the PYD as well and YPG. We've just seen even in um, uh, Sinjar, I think, yeah. something that looked like a move between yeah. uh, between the Hashtad al Shabi and uh, and uh, and the. Uh, uh, PKK. So I'm wondering, is this going to be, are we in danger of having another instance in which the U.S. backs an actor that, uh, you know, we help them and are the main movers behind getting rid of this one really bad actor only to have some other of our rivals and adversaries step into the mix, uh, perhaps with the PKK and, uh, and PYD and the Russians and Iranians somehow become the, the great beneficiaries of this victory in northeastern Syria? Yeah, well, there are huge uh, geopolitical implications for this. Um, I think that goes w goes without saying. If if I was advising the YPG or the PYD and they would listen to me, which I, after today I suspect <laughs> that they won't. Um, but, if, but if they did, I would say you need to pull back to the traditionally Kurdish regions of Syria and consolidate your gains there. And that would offer a huge gesture of goodwill um, to the international community and to the players in the region that you're, you're not, um, you know, everything that you, people thought you were and described as and, and et cetera. But I don't know if they're going to do that. I tell you what, it's my opinion that if the YPG hangs around and thinks they're going to govern in any significant way Raqqa, it will plant the seed for ISIS 2.0. We might not see it in a year. We might not see it in five years. But if we think that, um, that this sort of arrangement, that the local Arab tribes in this region are going to accept this sort of arrangement, I think we're delusional. And I just fear that we have no plan for what happens when r the black flag of the caliphate falls in Raqqa and the YPG is left there with their flag with the red star, um, uh, w what this means for the local dynamics on the ground. Um, I've heard as well Manj Manbij is described as a success story, but this is th this, the piece there is largely brokered and underwritten by the fact that U.S. Special Operations Forces are patrolling the streets, and no one, want, no one very or rightfully wants to tangle with them. So this idea that we're going to have U.S. Special Operations Forces patrolling the streets of Raqqa indefinitely just to maintain some sort of fragile peace in northeastern Syria, I think is, is um, perhaps not the most sensible use of, of that U.S. capability. Um, so I, uh, my prediction is uh, many of the ISIS fighters that, that flee Raqqa will be absorbed into some of the more Islamist groupings that, are, that make up other factions of the opposition. I suspect that some of the territory that the YPG captures but they don't feel very comfortable holding on to will be transferred to Assad. We've seen a record, a track record in some cases of YPG handing over land to the, to the regime. And then uh, in terms of what it means for Raqqa itself, it's anyone's guess. Good. Um, I wanted to ask uh, maybe both of you about the impact of YPG, PYD victory in Raqqa on the broader transnational Kurdish movement. How does it affect, or does it, uh, the dynamics, A, between the, let's say, the PKK, broadly speaking, and uh, the KRG, in particular, President Barzani and the Kurdistan uh, Democrat, the KDP, the Kurdistan Democratic Party uh, first, and then any impact inside of Turkey itself and, and amongst Turkey's Kurds, or are these independent events? And well, first of all, I tend to agree with Luke about how you know precarious the situation in Raqqa will be, and um, you know I do also share his concerns about poten potential Arab 
Kurdish conflict, especially in the absence of, of you know, a U.S. presence, uh, if and when the United States decides to withdraw. What does uh, victory in Raqqa mean? Uh, I mean, obviously, the YPG, PKK will um, spin that as a huge, you know, a, a sign of its growing strength and obviously, uh, you know, advertise the fact that it's doing this with the help of the United States uh, and somehow presenting this as a further sort of poke in the eye to Turkey. Um, but obviously, there comes a point where the fact of just being an, a, a military ally won't be enough. They're going to have to, you know, to show s something more than that, you know, a, a signs of a, a political relationship <coughs> developing, of which there is none at the moment, uh, absent the fact that people like Ilham Ahmed and others come to Washington uh, occasionally and talk to people, but they're not at Geneva. Uh, the U.S. has not recognized their feder federation, uh, and I don't see any signs of that in the near future. So uh, that's the point where things will get kind of dicey. Mm -hmm. And let's not also forget the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, Syrian Kurds are kind of bifurcated. You have the whole Afrin part, which the United States is absolutely not interested in. You know, that's for the Russians, the regime, whoever else, you know, want, wants to deal with it can. And uh, I think the YPG is pretty squeezed there because the Russians are playing this very um, <coughs> sort of clever game of holding up the Turkish bogeyman to force the YPG to let the regime advance further into its territory. Uh, so, you know, I think overall uh, we can say that the YPG has kind of reached the limits of its, its expansion and influence. David, do you have a, a view on, um, on the broader impact of yeah. this on the um, Kurdish I, movement? I have, <laughs> I have a lot of views, but not <laughs> a lot of time. So I would just say um, I, I agree with Luke that it would be good advice to the YPG, and maybe they'll take it yeah, from me, if <laughs> not from you, <laughs> to uh, moderate their ambitions to pull back to the largely Kurdish areas and uh, let go of Raqqa um, as much as um, they, as much as is practical. And I, I think the main issues in Raqqa are going to be actually more between the Bedouin tribes that have allied themselves with the YPG, the Shamar in particular, Arab tribes right, in the SDF, and we're talking about maybe 20,000 fighters, not, not trivial, uh, on the one hand, and the tribes and other Arab inhabitants of Raqqa, the, the actual local population. They don't get along, and they've picked opposite sides in the Syrian civil war, and that's going to be very messy. But the YPG would be well advised, I think, to bow out of that fight if they can. Uh, that's number one. Number two, <laughs> the bigger geopolitical thing. The, I don't think that whatever the YPG manages to achieve in, or the PYD uh, in Syria is going to have much effect on the Kurdish question in Turkey. I agree with Amberin that Turkey needs to solve its own Kurdish question, but I, I insist that at least as I see it that these are more separate issues than issues that are, uh, yeah the PKK or YPG gains in Syria to, to, to actually come to some kind of accommodation. Well, that would be great. It's become if, if a piece of okay. the bargain. That's if what happened in 2013 when that, they resumed the talks with happens, Öcalan. If that happens, great. If this actually encourages Turkey to... But there can't uh, be a trade-off. That's the problem. Turkey wants a trade. You know, I, I understand. That's why that's And that why won't I'm work. Uh, that, that I agree. But in any case, I think the, the future of these two Kurdish populations is largely separate. Uh, Syrian Kurds are one thing, uh, Turkish Kurds are something else. I know that they share the same dialect, that they share Families. a lot of history, that they Families. share a lot of family. But in the last five years, that was then, this right. is now. Good. In the last five years, they have gone their own way. And finally, I think they've merged. They've that wait a second, no. wait a second. <laughs> no. Go, Dave, quick, that, quick, that make your quick, last point. That, that last point is that when it comes to 
the even bigger geopolitical issues. Uh, Kurds from Jizr are wait, wait, dying wait, in Kobani. Amber, 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 I got I got to go. I, I know that, but those are individuals. David, 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 stick condition. on your point. Come on. My point is that, or else I'm going to cut you both off, and we'll go nothing, to questions. Nothing to do, or almost nothing to do, with the KRG in Iraq. The KDP and the PYD YPG do not get along. The border is mostly closed between those two. Uh, the KDP has allied itself more with Turkey than with Kurds, either in, Tur in, in Turkey or in Syria or any place else. And so th this will not have an impact, I think, on that. And that's a good thing, because Turkey-KRG relations are very good, and I hope they stay that way, regardless of anything that happens anywhere else with Kurds or anybody else in the region. The last point is about Iran and Russia. I, it is true. And it's important that the Syrian Kurds have other options besides the United States to play against Turkey, against maybe the Assad regime, if they decide that they really want to insist on autonomy and not just economic dependence and sort of submission to the victorious Assad regime, because that's what it is. Uh, the, the Russia and Iran have both indicated in practice and even sometimes openly that they are up to a point that they're interested in supporting the Syrian Kurds. Russians have troops in Afrin, uh, as Amber mentioned, um, and Iran through the Hashtashabi in Iraq and through the PKK in Sinjar and in other ways is trying to create an opening to the Syrian Kurds. And I think it's in the American interest, as part of our much broader geopolitical strategy in the region, vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Russia, to make sure that we don't lose the Syrian Kurds to an Iranian and a Russian alternative. Good. Thank you. I'm late going to questions, so I'm, I apologize, but there was a lot of very good stuff to get out on the table. Um, let me go to the audience. We've got some microphones. They'll bring them to you. Please identify yourself, and really, please try and limit yourself to an actual question. Um, yeah, right, right next to you there. Hi, my name is Aaron Friedman. Um, I just wanted to return to a question that was raised earlier as to whether ISIS control of Raqqa and other territory is more likely to lead to them avoiding the West or um, makes it more likely that the gives them more opportunity to attack the West. I think that was. Luke, you, you, you raised this question. It was a question, as their territory constricts, more likely to attack or less likely once they're defeated in Raqqa, let's well, say, and their know, the mean, caliphate's is, brought for, down? For years, I never really bought into the argument that terrorist organizations have to hold physical territory to launch and plan international attacks. I mean, it might help. It might make it easier. But perhaps they could plan for it in Hamburg and then train for it in Florida and Texas, <laughs> like they did on 9-11. Um, and it seems like the more uh, territory ISIS is losing, the more ISIS-inspired or ISIS-backed attacks there are around the world. Um, perhaps it's a sign of desperation or what, I don't know. But um, I just don't, I don't buy into this. I feel, I'm actually speaking to a pillar because I can't <laughs> see the, gentleman, <laughs> the gentleman behind it. But, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, so uh, I think ISIS will, as a terrorist organization with a set of goals, will attack however and whenever it can regardless if it holds territory or not. To some degree, doesn't it hold in territory? All right, sorry, I, I, I really, I got, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. It generates recruitment, it helps them with legitimacy, I get yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, very unruly, very unruly, everybody. <laughs> we need That's good. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, hi, Jeff Clark, I'm a reporter from AFP. I've heard it suggested that one of the reasons that Erdogan didn't make more of a fuss when he came here was that he's been promised that uh, the U.S. will either green light or even support an operation against Sinjar after Raqqa falls. If that was to happen, do, do you think we're immediately going to lose friends in the YPG? Icon, do you, or Iambrin, do you want to take it? Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, I think what the United States has always promised Turkey is to continued um, intelligence sharing and you know military support against the PKK. That distinction between YPG and PKK is of course works to Turkey's advantage in that sense mm -hmm. because it allows the US to do precisely that. Very As for Sinjar, I think what's happening on the ground has been slightly mischaracterized here today. In fact, the Hashd Shabi right. are pushing the PKK back and they're right. saying we don't want you here, you know, scram which possibly explains Turkish silence over the 
over the Hashd al-Shabi's moves along the Syrian border and actually reaching the Syrian border uh, because it suits their interests to see the PKK being pushed back in the north. And also um, the notion that Iran would rely on the Kurds for some kind of corridor, I think is nonsensical. Mm -hmm. Iran also shares Turkey's paranoia over the Kurds. And uh, so I don't think, um, in fact, Turkey is very unhappy with what's happening on the ground currently and doesn't necessarily need the United States to help it do anything in Sindar at this point. Anybody have anything to yeah, add on this? I, that I, I, I agree with half of what you said, which is well, that's which better is pretty than good. Where we were <laughs> 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 we're, making, we're making progress. <laughs> making progress. The, the half that I agree with is that Turkey doesn't need to do this anymore because the Hashd uh, al and, and in fact, Turkey would be very hard pressed to intervene today in Sinjar. I think it would have been a good idea a month ago <coughs> when Erdogan was here. Well, but they tried uh, and they killed Hashd yeah, al But now instead. they're, they're going to have to fight the Hashd al and they don't want to do that. Um, to take over that territory. But where I disagree is on the issue of what is the Hashd al-Shabi doing with the PKK? In, in my view, they're not pushing them back. They are coordinating with them. And they are creating a, a kind of um, possible, almost actual, corridor uh, for uh, people that uh, share certain common interests um, among them is an openness to work with Iran. And it's no secret that Iran has uh, dabbled in supporting the PKK, as John, I think, you mentioned. And um, that is but the opening. Iran exclusive. is paranoid about its own Kurds, but it is more than happy to support other Kurdish organizations against some of its perceived enemies or adversaries. To a Whether point. Yeah, to a point. Of course, to a point. Yeah. Yes, right here. Okay. <coughs> Hishar Rusoy from People's Democratic Party, the HDP of Turkey. Um, first of all, I would like to make a correction. Um, the YPG and PYD have not been included in the PK in Turkey's terror list. Despite the rhetoric of anti-terrorism, the cabinet of ministers never included them in the mm, terror list. It was only the decision of a local court in Mardin in 2014. So we need to be very careful in that. And I think it is good that Turkey has not included both PYD and YPG in the terror list because I think at one point they may feel the need to negotiate with them. And that points to the flexibility of the Turkish government. The second point is the rapprochement between PYD and Turkey happened within the peace process when Turkey was actively negotiating with the PKK. So now it seems that in the U.S. here, there are I mean, some people advising to the U.S. administration that in exchange of the support to the PYD and YPG, the, the U.S. should be more supportive of Turkey in militarizing the Kurdish conflict in Turkey, for God's sake, that is counterproductive. All the efforts of the U.S. government should be concentrated in finding a way to resume the peace process between Turkey and the Kurds on either side of the Turkey-Syrian border. This is our opinion. But I want to have a question to uh, look, uh, and I know just from your bio that, I mean, you have also worked with the Brit British Defense Secretary and, you know, a lot of political career in uh, the U.K., so I really wonder about why there is almost 100 overlap between the British Conservatives and Turkey over YPG and PYD. <laughs> well, uh, firstly, it's been six years since I officially and formally worked for the, the, the British government or the Conservative Party. And in, in my capacity, it was uh, predominantly in the, so this was pre, well, this was early days of Arab Spring, and then I moved here to Washington. So, I, you know, honestly, I can't give you the answer that you probably deserve uh, on that question. Okay. Yes, sir, right here. If Wait, wait for the microphone. Uh, my name is uh, Hossein Bor, American Baluch Council. Uh, thank you very much for a great informative uh, huh, panel. My question is specifically addressed to David and Luke. Uh, as you know, all the reports suggest that uh, the 
Iranian mullahs, they are controlling about 100, 220,000 uh, Shia militia or Hajj al-Shadi mm -hmm. in Iraq. So once the Iraq is pacified and controlled by the central government, uh, what will happen to those 120,000 uh, Shia militias? Will they be unleashed against KRG? Or they will be unleashed against Israel or Saudi Arabia? Or what? <laughs> I, I, for this panel, I just want to know, are they going to move across the border into Syria and try and, uh, and help Assad regain control of the entire country? Is that the... Yes. Is that the yes. Yes? You believe the Shiite militias go, uh, yeah. they move from they're Mosul ready. They're uh, ready. and Western Iraq? They're already there okay. in great numbers. I, yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay. Whoa. That, well, I, I, yeah, all right. <laughs> I will add one quick, one, like, 15-second yeah. yes. point. Sure. You know, the, the fight against ISIS in, in Iraq is the glue that's really, I think, holding everything together right now. And when that common enemy is gone, um, we're really, the, the, these different um, actors with these different interests, including these Shia militias, that is really going to accentuate the divisions that really exist in that country. Okay, okay no, I've got I've to go get some, <laughs> and some other questions. Anything over here? Yes, this gentleman over here. Uh, Ari Goldman from the Washington Kurdish Institute. Uh, and my question is, <coughs> excuse me, you've seen ISIS be pretty proficient at uh, civilian administration. So uh, are Arab elements in the SDF going to be ready to govern Raqqa? Uh, or are they going to rely on uh, the Kurdish elements for the actual administration of the city? Anybody know for sure? <laughs> well, first of all, y y your question sort of seems to suggest that the Kurds are very good at administrating, um, <laughs> administering, uh, you know, stuff in, 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 in Syria. And I would beg to differ with that. I mean, having been there, I think Kurds are very good at the Kurds there are very good at fighting, but when it comes to management, it's, it's slightly, you know, trickier, and it's a learning process for them as well. I think everybody is pretty, um, you know, uh, uh, everybody's trying to learn how to do things at this point. It's not easy, especially in a conflict situation. Yeah, I, I imagine that the situation in Raqqa could be a real mess. I'm not sure exactly what we're going to find in terms of a population that is prepared to accept outside governance from from anybody or capable of governing it itself. Um, John, that it may it may continue to be very fertile ground for some very nasty elements or for the Assad regimes. Can I, ask I don't know. I'm a question. W would you uh, would you agree that Kurds, because of their experience in Turkey, have more know-how than other groups in governing multi-ethnic and multi-faith communities? Be be because this is mostly about experience and know-how, <laughs> and they tend to have, because it's, it's quite a porous border, and information, experience flow through the border, and we, we've seen, for example, the, the BJP. Okay, okay, we got, we're, we're getting very close to the end. Do you have an answer to It's a completely you different context, you know. There's a conflict going on in Syria. It's very hard to run. And there's no, you know, <coughs> half of the time there's no water, there's no electricity. Uh, I think it bears no parallels, really. Yes, this gentleman right, right here. Uh, my name is Robert. Uh, I'm representing American Syriac Union. Uh, I have a question. Maybe everybody or some of the audience was speaking about like optimism. Let me go to the other side, like pessimism. Uh, how uh, Erdogan, every time that he's in TV, is saying, okay, if, uh, if something happens and if uh, something is bad, we will do what it will take. Mm -hmm. That means we will go into Syria and we, we will do yeah. what it takes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to hear from the, uh, from the panelists. Okay. What is that? W w yeah, well like, what is the point to take Turkey to in Raqqa? And uh, after that, if it happens, what U.S. will do? What do you think? Okay, well, very briefly, uh, I just on the point about administration, the one thing that's key is not Kurds or Arabs. It's economic dependence, complete economic dependence on the Assad regime, unfortunately. That is the situation of the Kurdish cantons in Syria today. They depend on Assad for money, for fuel, <laughs> for 
uh, transit, for education, for hospitals, and in return, that uh, the Assad regime is the, the government or the economy that buys almost everything that the PYD has to export or offer, agricultural products mainly, and a little bit of oil, crude oil. So uh, that's, okay. that's okay. Okay. Now, I'm to no, no, I'm no, going. Wait, I'm going wait, over wait, here to Turkey. Right, Turkey. Right. I'm going to my t Turkish okay. expert. Uh, Icon on the question of why does Erdogan all the big talk, the threats, the uh, uh, we're going to do something if we're now now two t two key points on this. One, we have to keep in mind the calendar. Erdogan has three elections to win in 2019: local, national, and presidential. And as he has warned his own party, this election is different. He said this time 40 percent won't bring us to power. We need 50 percent plus one, which means he doesn't have too yeah. much flexibility until November 2019. Second point, he's willing to do anything he wants, he, he is necessary. Mm -hmm. That's not a possibility. Turkish military I I is really decimated. Uh, Erdogan has very little capacity for cross-border <laughs> action. So I think uh, until the election, uh, because of election uh, reasons and also for because of Turkish military's deficiencies, uh, we probably won't see much action. Maybe we'll see something in Qatar. Maybe. <laughs> 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 Whole other panel. We're not. We're not that's joking. That's yes, that's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's we've reached. Right now. Yeah, yeah, we've reached the end of our, our yeah. time. Uh, please join me thanking a very, very spirited, excellent panel. Thanks to all you guys, and thank you all for coming. We'll see you. See you next time.